Ah yes, we reached the shore. I don't believe it until I've stepped off the wood and my boot sinks into the sand. I walk further inland like a corpse, my sole instinct to flee from the waterline. My hazy eyes single in on something ahead. The guide stands on an outcropping in the distance, watching like a sentinel. He doesn't even come to greet us. I stare at him for a moment, not even able to feel alarmed at my own lack of feelings about the situation. He uses his staff to gesture to the forest behind him before disappearing between the trees. I can only assume he must be asking me to follow. The guide takes us further inland, more towards the centre. There's a view of the coastline from here, but we're also partially obscured by a few trees. It's time to sleep. Thanks for letting us know, mate. No one has the energy to argue with him at this moment. I find a place as comfortable as one could ask for in a location like this, next to one of the trees further out and lay down, trying to block out my thoughts. For once, exhaustion is my ally, and I slip off into sleep. My eyes slowly blink open and readjust to the brightness, what little there is. The sun is obscured by a thick layer of fog, making it impossible to estimate the time of day. I prop up my elbows and push myself up. The ground is hard and rocky, but that isn't the only reason I am eager to get on my feet. I check my surroundings. The harsh, craggy earth of the island is interlaced with twisting vines and gnarled branches. Beside me, Margaret and Lou are still fast asleep. The guide, however, is nowhere to be seen. I realise that I don't recall seeing him lay down with everyone. It's likely he left us hours ago. There is a creeping silence here. I can't help but shudder at the hollow, aching feeling inside of me. It refuses to relent. I shift my weight back and forth, unsure of what to do with myself. Memories of last night's harrowing journey flicker through my mind. I notice the others begin to stir. Margaret accidentally knocks Lou as she gets up, awakening him as well. My mouth opens, then shuts, and after a moment of fumbling, a word finally escapes. Hello. Good word. Hello to you. Margaret greets me as she rubs her eyes. It seems to be due to trouble adjusting to not having her glasses rather than grogginess. Behind her, Lou remains on the ground. Oh, we should eat something soon. Do we even have food? I don't trust what is on this island, so I'll have to split my supplies with Lou. I admit, for a trip of this length, I could only manage to carry the minimum, so I don't have much to share. However, you shouldn't be the only one who'd give something up. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'm not hungry. Lou's back is turned against us. He still hasn't gotten up out of the dirt. I won't make it very far if you don't have something to eat. Lou buries his head deeper into his knees as he curls into a tighter ball. No thanks. Just eat, you fool. I wonder when the last time he ate even was. Considering where we found him, he could have been out over Sinlos for more than a day. Yet, he has nothing with him. I'm concerned about that as well. But I know it can be difficult to force yourself to eat after something traumatic. And I'm afraid I'm not very skilled at encouraging others. There's a stinging sensation inside of me. That was not something I ever needed to do because he was there. Margaret and I both frown. I look the pricks back. A distinct rustling of the leaves around catches my attention. The guide appears, emerging from the thicket. Margaret seems to be a little uncomfortable at his return. Lou doesn't notice. The guide nears us and begins to speak. The Nixie will not tread on land in daylight. However, being near the shoreline is still dangerous. If you leave the center of the island, remain cautious. Before the sun sets, I will be in this area. It would be wise to meet me here before nightfall. And just what needs to be done over in those woods that cannot be done in the brush here with the rest of us? He has a point, hmm? Despite Margaret's pointed question, the guide considers his piece here finished. He turns around and returns to the forested area from which he came. Beside me, Margaret releases a sigh. Are you alright? No, I'm not. 
nothing is all right, but it will never get any better. <laughs> Margaret sucks in a breath as she starts to get emotional. Before it can spill out of her, she turns on her heels and walks off in a direction different than the guides. I don't try to stop her. Lou meekly calls to me. I turn around to face him, though I don't speak. He's standing some distance away. He fidgets and glances over to the side before returning his gaze to my eyes. He gestures for me to come closer. I comply. He begins to whisper at me, but he fumbles with his words and I can't make out anything he says. I look at him inquisitively. Finally, he speaks up enough to be clear. I'm sorry for what happened last night. He speaks quickly as he looks up at me, eyes filled with sorrow. He shifts his focus downwards. You would have been better off without me. It's not your fault. My words come out hollow and empty. I mean what I say, but I cannot find the energy to make it seem convincing. It was closer to being my fault than anyone else's. I wasn't supposed to be here, but all I did was get in the way. The guide was right about me. I knew from the beginning that it would be like this too. I mean, the person who created your story, Lou, made it so that someone is always going to die, so it just happened to be Bemele this time. I never should have stayed. Finishing his thought, he sniffles as he turns away. Suddenly, I feel a strong surge of emotions rip through me. Everything is falling apart and I do not have the power to change this. Quietly, I speak. Lou, wait. Lou stops moving. He doesn't turn to face me. I already decided we're going after this guy first. I hesitate as well, also unsure of how to proceed. Would you be willing to speak with me? He turns around to face me, and his eyes are brimming with tears. He smiles slightly. I could do that. I find the will to smile lightly back at him. Lou walks closer to me, then pauses. After watching me for a moment, he turns his eyes to the ground, waiting for me to do something. I just stare at him, unsure. After a brief silence, I finally sigh. Lou, can I ask you a difficult question? He flinches. I don't think I'm the person you want to ask difficult questions. No one else can answer this one. It's about you. Oh. In that case, I'm really not the kind of person to give good answers. By his tone, it seems like he's trying to make light of the situation, but to me, it still just sounds sad. I understand. He squeezes his eyes shut and gives no reply. Despite cl being clearly frustrated, it doesn't look like it's me he's upset with. Soon, he reopens his eyes, looking directly at me. You can ask me anything. I'll try to answer. But I hope you have a lot of patience. He smiles slightly. Thank you. So, what do you want to know? Have you lost someone in the lake? Lou stumbles back a step from shock. I'm sorry for prying, but when we found you, it seemed like you were apologizing to someone. And the way you've acted since makes me think that something is wrong. Something beyond even being out on Simlos. I give, him, I give him a sympathetic look. Why am I even asking him this question? Do I really want to help him, or am I trying to forget what happened to us by talking about someone else's misfortune? When Lou speaks, his voice is barely above a whisper. I hate myself. I can't do anything. You don't have to say any more. I was wrong to ask you about it. His brows are furrowed, and he smiles in a self-deprecating way. I'm sorry. Lou laughs sharply at himself. Don't be. I'm not with the concern. He has a very low opinion of himself, apparently. How can you say that? What have you done that was wrong in this moment? It was only my mistake. You think that because you don't know. I do not believe you. Lou's eyes bore into me. I'm not upset because I lost someone out here. I'm upset because I can't bring myself to lie about it. What? You gave me the perfect opportunity to cover up the pathetic truth of what actually happened. All I had to do was go along with your assumption. But when you're so direct, I can't keep my thoughts hidden. I'm too afraid of making a mistake and having the lie uncovered somehow. He stares back at the ground and sighs. Why do I have to be so terrible at this? Talking about... God, I, it's so confusing. 
Bewilderment rings through my mind, one ear to the other. His words stir all sorts of baffling, jumbled emotions in me that battle it out for supremacy as I gawk. Lou is... I don't know. Without looking up, Lou shakes his head. See? You shouldn't waste your sympathies on someone like me. You should have left me to die. Like a shot, my anger flares up. Pull yourself together. I didn't leave you behind before, and I'm not going to do so now. The best thing you can do to help is put those kinds of thoughts in the back of your mind. Oh, what? I won't make it to the other side? Lou laughs bitterly, his smile almost cruel. If I thought joining you was a way to stay alive, I would have acted much differently. The only reason I came along is because I thought it might be nice to not die alone and forgotten. My words sputter and die on my tongue. Lou continues his speech, ignoring my reaction. The guide really did know what he was saying before. I asked him if I could go out on the bridges in the past. He told me not to. He said I couldn't handle it. I'm not sorry for ignoring the warning. This was something I had to do. But why? This was my only chance to prove I'm not worthless. Or to finally accept that I was, once and for all. When we know what the truth is... What? <laughs> Stop. I can no longer keep idly si listening to him speak. It doesn't have to be this way. You said yourself that it isn't over until it's completely over. There's still a possibility that... No, there isn't. My blood pounds in my veins. Instinctively, I place both my hands on his tightly wrapped upper arms. I don't know what has happened to you, but if there's something you need to do, you can try again tomorrow night. You don't need to give up. You have value. Lou closes his eyes again and smiles to himself. I maintain my grip on him, waiting for his response. All right. I'll try to stay alive, if you'll do something for me. What is it? Don't put yourself in danger for my sake anymore. I'm probably gonna do it. Just saying. My fingers curl harder around his thin arms, wishing I could argue further. But I don't know what is going on in his head, and I might push him back into giving up. I don't have the luxury of trying to reach him a second time. I release him and take a step back. Fine. I'll accept those terms. Good. Now you might survive. You need to survive too. He laughs. It goes without saying. Lou smiles teasingly. His attitude is still difficult for me to grasp, but I attempt to smile in return. This one, I, I guess? you don't want anything to happen to anyone else. That is admirable. Lou says nothing, however, I do feel my words reached him. I wish he would let me help him, but I cannot find the way to do so. I can only trust that he will do his best to take care of himself now. It's better than him planning to let it end. I sigh wearily, and yet somehow feel as though my resolve has been strengthened. At least for now. I'm going to head out. I want to see how everything is on the island. I'll make it easier by coming along. Then you won't ever have to check on me. This time, I am able to smile easily. That would be good. Happy to help. He readily moves beside me, and together we move out. Lou and I head through the wooded part of the island. There isn't anything that could be called a path, but we managed to pick our way through the bush quite well. Through a thinner strand of trees, we briefly catch sight of the guide standing on one of the beaches. He seems fine, but even though I'm sure he turned his head towards me, he makes no show of acknowledging us. We move on and eventually find Margaret in a jagged clearing. Margaret begrudgingly lifts her head as we approach, enabling me to see that her face is damp and tear-stained, while her eyes are red and puffy. She's been crying. I shift between my feet uncomfortably. Is something the matter? Margaret's glance moves to Lou. She laughs without humor. Are you keeping an eye on the rest of us to make sure we don't get into trouble? No, Smilet. Anything could happen, so it is good to stay alert even in daylight. Lou is here because he was also concerned. Well, that's nice. She speaks somewhat curtly, but at least she no longer seems as depressed. Does this mean you don't have something to say? Margaret shakes her head. I'm happy to report that everything's in order on this front. I'm glad. Of course, I cannot fully believe that. Margaret isn't saying what's actually on her mind, but I have no way of tr to truly reach her. Well, we're not on her route, so that makes sense. Is that everything? She's so mad we didn't choose her route. I can I feel it. I suppose it is. 
My words come out slowly and hesitantly, as though she might change her mind if I bide my time. I want to do more, but I cannot think of what else I could do for her. Then goodbye. If you need anything, we will be close by. Yes, thank you. I'm sure I'll see you soon. The response is sincere. It is enough to ease some of my worry. I smile, though weakly. We leave her be and head off on our own. It's good to know the others are well. We have nothing to do with our time now. Even I can't ignore the wistful tone in my voice. Something is tugging at my heart, trying to tear a piece away. Lou seems uncomfortable with my lowering mood. He stares out into the woods rather than at me. I... I think I'll go to the shore. His words snap me back hard to, to hard reality. What? Why? I saw something earlier that I'd like to check out. The shoreline is dangerous. Whatever you saw could not be worth the risk. Lou actually laughs. A sudden sound that's as close to snickering as it is to sputtering. Watching a nix drag itself across the shore in the middle of the day would be worth the danger, in my opinion. I give him a humorless, reprimanding look. I feel vaguely like I have used this face to dissuade pets and young children from behaving poorly in the past. I was only joking. Thankfully, it seems to work on grown men as well. I hope he is telling the truth. For someone so nervous, he can be quite reckless. I'm still going, though. Don't worry. I I'll be careful. We talked about this. He gives me a self effacing, lopsided smile. You said you didn't want to make me watch out for you. I'll be back soon. You won't even notice. I sigh. Part of me wants to keep lecturing him on how serious this is. I just want him to be safe, but I fear I don't have the words to convey that without making the situation worse. Fine. I will come. Lou brightens. Of course you can come. I'd enjoy that. I get the feeling he was hoping I would say that. It is not as though I don't want to be around him, the farthest thing from it. It's the activity itself that's the problem. Despite my reservations, we head to the beach. Lou strides easily across the sand, his bare feet sinking down in the loose grains as he stretches his arms contentedly. It is so much nicer out here. I make sure to stay close behind him, just in case. I would not want him to go off on his own. Lou notices my position out of the corner of his eye. He isn't so distracted that he's forgotten I'm here, it seems. He takes a wide step back so we are side by side instead. I can't help but be surprised by his assertiveness and it makes me grin nervously. You know what I mean, right? Yes. The shore has its positives. I find it hard to navigate the loose sand in my boots, but Lou has little trouble here. There are only a, a few ragged bandages wrapped around his bare feet. I have to wonder how he has been faring thus far. The forest floor is rock hard and full of thorns. I clandestinely check for any signs of bleeding. Thankfully, there are no traces of it. It also does not escape me that, he's lo that losing one's shoes is an uncommon occurrence. They must have been stolen, or he did not have any to begin with. Hmm. Between my swirling thoughts and Lou's quiet self-assurance, we have walked in silence for a bit. This should be a good chance to ask questions about his life, where he comes from, what he does for work, if he has any other family. However, I cannot help but assume he would shrink away from such attention. Lou catches my gaze and inclines his head, a whisper of a smirk on his lips. Is there anything on your mind? Something you'd like to ask he me, knows. maybe? He knows. Oh. Yes. I'm surprised you brought attention to it. Lou snickers in a self-aware sort of way. When you're as suspicious as I am, it's pretty easy to guess that people will have questions. I smile faintly. His openness is certainly appreciated, but the look fades as quickly as it appeared. I turn away. I think I've asked you enough questions. Lou's expression sinks into melancholy. He holds my eyes in his own, tightly locked and refusing to let go. Then he speaks, unbidden. I've done odd jobs most of my life. The only title you could say I've had is Messenger Boy. He hangs his head in embarrassment over his achievements and begins to drift further away. That is nothing to be ashamed of. Information is meaningless if it is not with those who can use it. There are far less honorable ways of making a living in this world. I can think of some too. Some that I've done. 
His words are mumbled, so it takes a moment for them to sink in. I'm not sure what to say, so I settle on closing some of the distance between us in an attempt to console him. Admittedly, I expected as much. His jitteriness and defensive posture are typical of a petty criminal. I imagine he's had a tough life. The warmth between us melts the dark mood that was beginning to form. A teasingly crooked smile blooms on Lou's face as he relaxes again. Thank you. I can say I'm grateful. That's what I'm grateful for. At that, I am able to chuckle and give a bent grin in return. There's no trouble. Lou turns his head away bashfully and lifts his hand, steadily inching it towards me. My pulse starts to race. He lets it drop before he touches me. It is a relief as well as a disappointment. Once again, silence falls between us. Suddenly, Lou begins running forwards. There is nothing ahead of us. I'm completely caught off guard and left momentarily dumbfounded. I shout after him to come back, concern rising in my chest. He keeps up the pace but turns his head back to look at me, almost as if he's enjoying this. We gotta see you. After a short sprint, he comes to a stop. As I reach him, he bends down and carefully picks something up off the sand. It's a strange, beautiful shell. Isn't it amazing? I wonder if other lakes have shells like this. I'm not able to stop myself from laughing. I don't know. Is that what you were expecting to find? It is. I like shells. The world is so dreary. And the flowers that bloom will wither and die in days without attention. I can't find a way to appreciate such fleeting things. It's only sad. As he speaks, his voice descends into despair, dropping so low I almost don't make out what he says. I cannot think why this shell is impacting him so profoundly, but I want to comfort him somehow, regardless of if it, I can fully comprehend him. Shells are beautiful and they can persevere. That is something I respect. It is good you were able to find what you were searching for. I think so too. He lets himself remain lost in this moment for a second longer, then gently offers his meaningful shell to me. Why don't you keep it? I think it will remind There's a me. certain cat that wants to come in my door. I have no idea on what to say. Those words seem so harmless and yet foreboding. Despite my silence, he continues to hold the shell out for me to take. Cautiously, I reach up to accept the gift, afraid that a wrong move could somehow hurt the shell or even him. When I have it, Lou places both his hands over my hand in the shell. Thank you for coming with me. He continues to make it difficult to speak. It takes some effort to hide the bashfulness in my voice. There was no trouble, Lou. Really. Thank you for this. However, even if you didn't give it to me, I would not forget you. Okay, I'm going to quickly pause here and let this cat in because I'm just going to keep... Picking away at my door and doing these cute little meows. Like, she's not a kitten anymore, but she still does kitten meows. It's really cute, and I won't be able to stand not letting her in. I'm gonna do that quick. Alright. He looks happier than I've ever seen him as he presses my hands more tightly. I'm so glad I met you. Likewise. I'm happy we crossed paths. I hope that will never change. If you think of me from time to time, it would make this all worthwhile. Even, it is, even if it is a more generous view of this than I would give, I relish his statement. Lou is finally showing some optimism towards life. I am still unsure why Lou came here to begin with, but it eases my mind to think that he may not have to regret the choice. Lou pulls away, locking a door I barely peeked inside. We can head back to the forest now. Right. That is for the best since we still need to rest before sundown. And we will take the smoothest routes mm -hmm. back to the clearing. Mm -hmm. She is gonna step on my keyboard and it's gonna be very annoying. Do I look so fragile? Don't step on my keyboard. I am not impressed with his attempt. I like no, yeah. Don't step on one minute. Get to bed. Okay. I am not impressed with his attempt at humor and look squarely at him as I speak my voice completely deadpan. Anyone would have trouble with no shoes. I figured someone like you would say I needed to toughen up. I shake my head fondly. His elusive way of speaking has grown on me some. Come on, we should go. 
comfort. I got an achievement called comfort. I do wish you could see that. Because achievements are fun to get. Oh, I didn't realise my keyboard had some um, of that uh, uh, sticky-ish stuff over the logo that I got to pull off. And there's probably one up here as well. There is. Maybe I shouldn't pull it off, but it's kind of addictive. Do that. Okay, I don't think there's one there. All right. Together, we return to the woods in what feels like no time we enter the clearing. Margaret is already there waiting for us. She greets us with a smile. Hello. I suppose we all had the same idea of coming here a bit early. The three of us quietly wait for the guide's arrival, occasionally chatting with one another as we rest. The sky turns orange as sunset comes upon us. And here he is, to ruin the day. As the colour seems to drain from the world, being consumed by the fog, the guide makes his appearance. Lou avoids eye contact with him. It's almost time. I nod and feel myself grow tense. We truly are about to return to those bridges. All of us wait in an uncomfortable silence until night falls. I've changed the batteries in my mouse, by the way, so it should not die anymore. We silently stand as one, forming a vigil of sorts. Our remaining lanterns illuminate the dark, prepared for tonight's journey. And yet, the way forward does not appear. The bridges haven't risen, risen from the depths. I glance to my side. The guy doesn't look at all pleased. The corners of his mouth have a, have a harsh bent as he briefly loses himself to heavy thoughts. We must go to the shore. He doesn't offer an explanation for why. Instead, he goes on without us. I follow after the guide, my forehead creasing with swelling worry. I'm just very confused why the bridges disappear um, at the daytime and then they suddenly just magically rise up. There are different beings in this universe, but I haven't seen any hint of, like, magic or anything like that. Behind me, I hear Margaret and Lou's unsure footsteps. The four of us press onto the shore. The dark waters lap at the edges of the sand, and as expected, the maze is still hidden beneath the surface. The guide grips his staff tighter still, his knuckles turning ghostly white. He sucks in a breath of air like he is about to speak, but he hesitates. We all stare at him expectantly. After a moment more, the guide is fed up with waiting. The bridges are late. If they don't arrive as soon as darkness falls, there's no telling exactly how long it will be before they do. Lou doesn't say anything, opting to stare at the ground with an obscured expression. I guess she doesn't have a voice line here? <laughs> Do you believe we will have enough time to cross? Time is by far the least of our worries. On the bridges we are constantly moving, which makes it easier to avoid the prowlers. However, this island does not offer that luxury. We're trapped here. My body goes rigid as his words sink in. More importantly, the bridges are raised above the waters. Nixie have difficulties pulling themselves up onto the bridges. The soft sloping of the shore will allow far more prowlers to drag themselves towards us. Not all will be as dangerous as the ones we've encountered thus far. However, we could easily be overwhelmed. A pit forms deep in my stomach. I stare at him aghast. I had no idea the situation was that dire. I glance from the waterline to the trees. What I'm looking for, I don't know. A sign of what might be to come, perhaps. Margaret moves into discussion. Her mood is rapidly declining as well. Then what should we do? We shouldn't stay on the shore if the monsters could be coming towards us at any moment. The guide closes his eyes and suddenly looks very worn down. Staying in the center of the island is the safest option. However, there's the risk that we may not be able to reach the bridges when they do rise. Prowlers could have taken full control of the shore by then. Remaining here with our lanterns will ensure the prowlers cannot move freely. My brows involuntarily knit together. I don't like the sound of taking additional risks in an area that is already so dangerous. 
but our options are thin. I will not be kept on this island for another day, so the shore is where I will be. You may wait at the edge of the forest, or even at the center of the island if you fear being attacked. If the prowlers come between us and you fail to make it to the bridges, I will leave you behind. He's so heartless. The guide has made his decision and we must the make ours. By the shore. Perhaps I could be positioned somewhat further back from you. And then the others could stay further back still. That would keep us safer, without having any major gaps of darkness between us and the shore. I'd say that's likely our best option, and we don't have time to come up with any other way regardless. Fine. Settled on the matter, the three of us begin to move away from the guide. He pays little attention to us, instead silently fixing his eyes on the water. I take my place in the mid middle of the shore, while Margaret and Lou hover closer to the island's core on the line between dirt and sand. After getting a sense of where they are, I turn my gaze ahead. At first, I think I'm being fooled by the fog. There are several white dots playing along the edges of the water. Dark globes begin to surface, and I see them for what they are. Eyes. So many white dribbling eyes, gleaming sharply against their pitch black bodies as the Nixie bob up and down. They surface and disappear in a loop each time, more sets of eyes and closer, surveying us more intently. Then they cackle. The sound is atrocious, gurgling, then turning high-pitched as they seem to take full stock of us. But we will read this in the next video. I will see you then. Bye.